We want to speak about how to handle the health workers. Of course, so far we know that we have 50 cases in the country, but out of those, one has died. Um, I believe one has recovered. There are two more that are expected to be uh, determined whether they have fully recovered later on. I should, I should, think, uh, should think today because when we had from the cabinet secretary, he said that in 48 hours after Saturday, uh, they were going to do a retest to confirm the status of those patients. And joining us this morning is Dr. Rina Shah, who is a specialist in the infectious diseases at the Aga Khan uh, University, uh, Aga Khan University Hospital here in Nairobi. Good morning, Dr. Tari. And uh, what can you tell us about the status of the coronavirus uh, pandemic in Kenya? Uh, how severe are the cases that you have already confirmed from what you know? Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to, to come on air. Um, the coronavirus epidemic currently has moved to community, as we heard earlier, um, and we all, we're all on high alert. We have 50 cases, and as you know, we have one mortality. Uh, the, one, the one mortality, unfortunately, was at our hospital. But before I say anything, I want to allay anxiety that 80% of patients who get the virus recover. They get mild to asymptomatic disease and do not even need admission to hospital. The ones that we see in hospital are the 15 to 20% that don't make it to hospital. In fact, they do not recover. And they may need to come to hospital and they need to be in the ward or in, in critical care areas. The one patient that died was in our critical care area. He was an elderly man with an disease and he had a comorbidity of diabetes. Um, yeah, yes, uh, Dr. Terry, I'm struggling to hear you clearly. Um, but Yes, I sort of heard you talk about uh, one of the patients with the complications, but uh, when you observe in the wards where the patients are admitted, how do, I mean, how do you describe how the disease moves from showing mild symptoms until the moment that you can say either you have recovered or you have lost your life as a patient? How is that journey? So, so, if, so uh, the patients who recover uh, have, have very mild disease. So they come in with, they have cough, cold, they have shortness of breath, and, and it's like a normal um, mild uh, vi viral illness, the normal flu that we get mm -hmm. and, and we cover. So we, we have ways we monitor them. We, you monitor the temperature, you monitor the oxygen saturation. Right. Um, the oxygen saturation in a normal human being should be about 90%. Mm -hmm. So we, when we monitor them and the oxygen saturation continues to fall, so it goes to like 86%, 85%, we know that this patient is deteriorating. So that's mm -hmm. how we monitor. Right. If we can maintain their oxygen saturation with by their own lungs or by additional oxygen that we give, we give them oxygen supplementation. That's when we think of putting them on a ventilator. A ventilator helps do your gas exchange. It helps you get rid of carbon dioxide, breathe in oxygen adequately in diseased lungs. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason for a ventilator. So by the time somebody's on a ventilator, they're very unwell mm -hmm. and their prognosis, their outcome is in, in normal circumstances as well, but okay. more so with coronavirus. With the patients who can maintain themselves on oxygen, uh, we, we would monitor, monitor them on a daily basis, three times a day, two times a day, depending on how they respond. And, mm -hmm. and often we see how much the, the lung continues to improve. So there's, there's two, we're, we're monitoring their daily to see if they're improving or deteriorating. Um, unfortunately, the one patient that died, I, I, I hate to say died at the Aga Khan Hospital, um, he wasn't able to maintain his oxygenation very well, despite okay. being on a ventilator, despite being on all the medications that we could give him to help him maintain that and his blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Tari, for these patients as, uh, during the time they're in hospital, are there any specific considerations in terms of, uh, uh, first, the diet that they have to be subjected to, and secondly, the sort of uh, medication or drugs that you administer to them? So diet-wise, you know, it's a normal healthy diet that most all our patients get. If they're diabetic or have other conditions, then, then they are given a diet specific to their condition. So, you know, diabetics will have low-sugar diet, low-carb diet. But, you know, all good nutritious food is fine. So diet-wise, it's, it's as with any other patient. Okay. Uh, Medication-wise, we're still not sure. I mean, there are lots of trials going on, and there's been lots of hype in the media. There's no one drug that cures coronavirus. We, we don't know. Okay. So we wait in that space. Yeah. 
Oh, all right. And I know earlier on you highlighted that uh, if you have um, a pre-existing condition, then your chances of survival are pretty slim because your immunity is already compromised. But when those complications happen, what is that that you should expect to happen to you, um, especially for patients that are in the country? So, so if so, so the first thing you need to do is if you have these conditions or if you're elderly, what you need to do is, is social distance now. I mean, we've reached the stage in the disease where we're having community spread. So that's the first thing is you've got to look after yourself. Mm -hmm. Stay okay. You're elderly, you have diabetes, we're not so social about HIV, but any comorbidity condition, stay away, you know, stay at home, at least for the next few weeks as we ride the epidemic. Mm -hmm. The second thing is what to be very vigilant, you know, watch your sugars, make sure if you're HIV, you make sure you take your medication, try and be as healthy as possible, eat a good diet, don't put yourself at any risk. Even if you even if you do have a comorbidity and you get coronavirus, that doesn't mean it's abysmal. The outcomes, does, it doesn't mean that everybody who has a comorbid that gets coronavirus dies. There's a, also a high chance that you will survive. Um, it's just that the ones we're seeing abroad, are these are the ones that are succumbing. But that doesn't mean that every person who's over 65 or every person who has a comorbidity will succumb to the disease. The outcomes, if there's good supportive care, are pretty good. Like I said, 80% of patients do well. Okay, all right. And um, from the global statistics that we have, we are told that uh, the health workers that are taking care of these patients, 30% of them will contract the disease. How to, what are we doing to ensure that the, the health workers that are um, handling these patients, whether it's at your facility or the, the government facilities, what are we doing to protect them? And what is the protocol like in as far as once you've been exposed or you've been involved in, with a patient, how do you protect yourself and the, your loved ones maybe back at home? That's a very pertinent question. And, and, and if I may just say yesterday, I sat in five meetings trying to come up with adequate protocols to both in my hospital and nationally to see what would be the best thing for, for the doctors. I think doctors in the front line have to have what we call PPE, personal protective equipment, um, which, is, which is gloves, goggles, um, uh, gowns at a minimum to, to protect them. And, and those are going to be availed pretty soon. Um, patients who do high risk procedures, so like the anesthetist to intubate a patient who has coronavirus, uh, respiratory therapists who may do a bronchoscopy on these patients need to have even what we call enhanced PPE. So it has a better protection than the normal PPE. So anybody who comes in in contact with what we call aerosolized droplets. So if you're close to a patient, so that, that the, the droplets from the patient can ent enter your, your mucous membranes, you need to go into enhanced PPE. As okay. opposed to somebody like me who sits in the consulting clinic and the patient is three meters away. So our level of pr protection is different. So there are different types of PPE and we are coming up with a protocol. Just watch that space and give us a day or two. It will be out. On, on, on who should be using what. Okay. All right. And um, finally, as we start to wind up, Dr. Terry, is that uh, we saw a situation in Spain. I was looking at the images there. The deaths have been very high in, in the, the European part of uh, the world. Talking about Italy, Spain, um, a few in the UK. A lot of deaths that are being reported. What exactly is the problem that you would think of? Because these are nations that we know that their health system is really way above ours. What exactly is the challenge that has befallen them? So I think these are countries that also have a very high elderly population. I think that's the, in terms of the number of people who are likely to succumb, they have a lot more than we do. That's my fingers crossed. And I really pray that what I say is true. Um, our, our population is, 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 is a younger population. So we're hoping that they would do better uh, than the population in, in, in Europe. Secondly, we started our social distancing a bit earlier than them. I think England, um, Europe, the US were, took a longer time to go into social distancing. Hopefully that will, that will, help, that will help us. Okay. But, but the awareness, you know, we, are, we have learned from other countries. So we have a lot of learning lessons from other countries. And if we act on them, and I think the government is already, if we act on that early, hopefully we can not get the surge that they're getting. The reason you get the reason people die during so the health facilities get overwhelmed and you just don't have the beds, the bed capacity to look after everyone. So you need to then decide, I have ten beds, I have twenty patients, who am I going to put on the ventilator? Okay. Hopefully by social distancing and staying at home, 
we don't get to that situation. All right, let's wind up on this. And of course, as a specialist, a specialist in the infectious diseases area, um, how are we supposed to bury the dead that lose their lives? I saw in Spain that uh, they, they are being buried alone and the people that are ferrying those bodies are very, oh, they are wearing very tight protective gear. What is the protocol like here in Kenya? So the, the, the protocol in Kenya, we're using the WHO protocol. We're saying, um, so we're, we're, we're reducing people going to funerals just because of social distancing. So unfortunately, people are being buried with very few people around them. They're very close families. And I think the most important thing is to protect people. That, you know, the, the dead have died, and yes, they should be accorded the right funeral. But the most important thing now is to, is to keep the, those who are alive safe, make mm. sure they don't get the infection. Mostly to date, there hasn't been an infection from a dead person to somebody who's looked after them or, you know, dressed them or, or, or carried out the last rites on these patients. We haven't got a case as yet. But remember, we only know this virus for four months. So we're, we're watching that space. We know from other conditions such as Ebola that the, the dead bodies were able to transmit the virus, but to date, not in coronavirus. Having said that, I think anybody that handles a dead body has to be very careful as to wear the right protective equipment to protect themselves. I think that's the most important thing. And currently, we're not doing autopsies on patients who die of coronavirus, again, to protect people um, who handle these, these bodies. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rina Shah, who is a specialist in infectious diseases at the Aga Khan University Hospital here in Nairobi. Thank you so much for making time for us and sharing those insights uh, with, uh, with our viewers. Thank you very much. Have a good day. All right. Have a good one, too.